Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining our Digital South by Southwest panel. Um, we just want to give it just 30 or so seconds to allow all of you that are on the line to populate and join, join our, our chat here. Um, we're really excited to have everyone. Looks like we got some good numbers going and we're excited for an excellent discussion today. So just give it another 10 or 15 seconds and then um, I'm happy to introduce uh, Jenna, Jenna Ben-Yehuda, who is the President and CEO of Truman. And uh, yeah, we'll take it from there. Thanks. Okay, everybody. Um, welcome again. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm Jenna Ben Yehuda. I run the Truman National Security Project and the Truman Center for National Policy. We're really thrilled to have all of you here, although I know we all, for so many reasons, wish we were together in person um, in Austin for what had been the initially planned presentation um, of this panel. I hope um, this call finds everybody safe and healthy uh, and nestled uh, in your respective homes. Um, this conversation has grown ever more timely and so we're excited to dig into so many important issues. Um, before I turn this over to Jennifer's highly capable hands, uh, I just wanted to thank all of our panelists for joining us, Josh, Igor, Jennifer, and Jess for helping us produce this effort. I also wanted to thank uh, Open Society Foundation and Carnegie Corporation of New York who are supporting this discussion today. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Jennifer and thanks again to everybody for joining. Thank you, Jenna, and thanks Truman, of course, for facilitating this panel and this really timely discussion. Um, obviously, this discussion has been a timely one for quite a while. Um, our discussion today is going to look different than it was going to look at South by Southwest, given some of the very uh, prescient issues of the day and why we're all staying home. Um, so I look forward to having a conversation today with our panelists on that. Um, and I'll go ahead and, and start by introducing our two panelists. Um, and first, I'll give a shout out to Camille Stewart, who is another Truman Fellow who was going to be on this panel. She's unfortunately had a family emergency to attend to, but she is a cybersecurity and legal expert currently with Google. Um, you can find her online. And we wish that you were here with us, Camille, and hope you're doing well. Um, so first, I'll introduce Josh Berthume. Josh has 20 years of experience in digital media, creative direction, and political and corporate communications. His areas of expertise include brand identity development, rhetoric, um, and behavioral economics. In 2010, he founded, he founded Swash Labs, which is a full-service advertising agency in Texas, and he's also the founder of Rogue Metrics, a research group focused on digital risk. So since 2017, his work has focused on digital risk, disinformation, and computational propaganda. And it's from this uh, perspective that we're gonna hear a lot of interesting um, conversation and, and expertise from him. Igor Yablokov um, is the CEO of Prion, an artificial intelligence company focused on augmented intelligence for the enterprise based here in North Carolina, which is where I'm sitting. Uh, as well. Named an industry luminary by Speech Technology Magazine, Igor previously founded industry pioneer Yap, the world's first high accuracy, fully automated cloud platform for voice recognition. Yap was subsequently acquired by Amazon in 2011 to help develop products such as Alexa voice service, Echo, and Fire TV. And fun fact, Alexa is actually Igor's sister's name. So every time you call out to Alexa at home, if you have that product, you are actually speaking to 
uh, <laughs> something named after Igor's sister. Um, I'm also a Truman Fellow. I have nearly 20 years of experience leading business strategy and partnership initiatives in eight countries with an expertise in technology, financial inclusion, healthcare, and private sector development. Um, more about me uh, on my LinkedIn or jenniferotala.com. I'm really excited now to, to jump into this discussion, and I first want to let everyone know who's on the call what we're going to get into today. We're going to focus on three different aspects of um, the conversation. One is awareness. So bringing awareness to uh, what is disinformation, what is misinformation, what does it look like today, and where are we at um, from a political standpoint, uh, from a policy standpoint, as well as um, you know, what are some actions that are being taken. Um, we're going to focus on COVID-19 and elections um, very specifically. Second, prevention. So what is currently being done to prevent the rise of disinformation? Um, and thirdly, action. What actions can be taken at a government level, at a um, corporation level, and at an individual level? Um, so keep that in mind as we go through, and I encourage everyone to uh, use the Q&A. Our team will be following um, your questions and we will get, have a dedicated time for question and answer at the end of this um, discussion. So I'd like to start with um, describing the risk environment. And after that, and we can get into what the drivers of those risks are. So when I think about drivers of those risks, I'm thinking about, of course, the technology, that's driving the risks, whether it's AI, social media, or immersive technology, as well as the psychological aspects that are driving those risks. So human behavior and cognitive bias. Um, so let's start with COVID-19. Um, I was on a phone earlier this week with Eddie Cohen, a friend of mine who works with Storyful, and he's a disinformation expert who's been following um, this area in medicine and healthcare for a number of years. This isn't new, what we're finding um, what we're finding right now with the misinformation and disinformation that is out there related to COVID-19, this particular coronavirus, um, is sort of a build on top of what we've been seeing since the early 2000s related to, you know, reaching out to those folks who are, who have vaccine hesitancy, et cetera, um, and, and really sort of promoting what WHO is at this point called an infodemic. Um, there's so much information out there, and it's hard for people to digest and understand what is real and what is not. And it's actually led to some, um, of course, bad behaviors, but it's even led to people making bad decisions related to their personal health, which are now affecting public health. So I'd like to hear from, um, for the start with Josh, what, are you, what is going on right now, and um, what can you make of it? Well, when we think about the risk environment for disinformation and, and computational propaganda, we're really talking about three distinct areas in terms of how I think about it along the lines of cognitive bias and uh, disinformation affecting people's ability to objectively understand reality. Um, one is disinformation uh, that comes from foreign sources. For instance, um, there's been several reports in the last couple of weeks, um, uh, analyses in the EU uh, and domestically that Russia uh, Russian intelligence is is pushing disinformation about coronavirus in order to try and uh, aggravate a public health crisis. So that's one version of that. Everyone got a lot of uh, education, uh, uneven as it was, about how foreign intelligence agencies engage in disinformation campaigns after the 2016 election. That threat continues to evolve. It's still happening. There is also a domestic uh, version of that where those tactics uh, sometimes along the lines of computational propaganda, meaning specifically bots, automation, um, running ads to uh, websites that are that appear to be legitimate news sources but actually aren't. Uh, all of that stuff gets adopted domestically because it's very cheap. You don't need to have a lot of technological skill in order to do it. Um, and there's almost no risk because as we have seen over the last four years or so, um, really no one gets in trouble for getting up to this kind of behavior uh, on the internet, even though the real world consequences can often be fairly grim. Uh, then the third version of this, uh, the third version of disinformation is disinformation from official sources, um, which uh, this can be government entities, which we imagine are trustworthy sources of information uh, dedicated to the public good. 
um, and uh, in the United States as well as in other countries around the world, that's, uh, that's an open question now as it is. The example I used before uh, we got into uh, a thing like the coronavirus was Jade Helm, where uh, executives at the top of, of Texas's state government, all the way up to and including uh, the governor, um, essentially took a rumor that had started to circulate on the internet and and legitimized it by saying, well, we're going to, uh, we're going to put uh, Texas forces out to make sure that the military is not invading Texas, essentially, um, which was ridiculous on its face, but it was good red meat for the political base. This is a kind of behavior that Greg Abbott is not the only one that does it, and it happens all over American politics, but it creates a crisis of belief in that when things are politicized and polarized and they come from official sources, uh, when it comes time for the government to do what it is supposed to do at its core, which is keep us safe during a, a moment of national crisis uh, or a real emergency, um, it is very difficult to know which sources to trust uh, and the bad information that can be uh, uh, distributed for political purposes uh, can kill people. Uh, and actually result in real loss of human life and real tragedy. Uh, and we've seen this as uh, recently as yesterday um, when, uh, it, you know, uh, the president has been giving uh, half or bad or ill-informed information about various treatments and, and drugs that he says have been approved by the FDA for stopping coronavirus, which haven't been. Um, and a uh, elderly couple in Arizona believing that they were going to cure uh, coronavirus took um, what amounted to uh, chemicals that are used to clean fish tanks, and the the husband died, um, and the uh, the wife was in ICU. Then she gave a testament to the news and said, uh, "You know, don't believe this. We thought it would. We we had received this information. We believed it to be true. We each took a teaspoonful of this stuff we thought was going to cure us, and now she's in critical condition, and her and her husband is dead." Yeah, it's it's really awful to see that happening. Um, I heard the same story and, you know, it, it, when we think about, um, you know, we think about the history even of, of media, right, in this country. The FCC used to regulate, um, you know, have regulations out there that were pulled back in 1987 around having, you know, fairness of, of information on issues that were really important for the, pu for the public to understand. Um, to see different sides of it. And um, it's a really interesting conversation to have around um, that particular moment in our history as it relates to what we have today with the, um, just the plethora of information out there with the uses of social media. I think, you know, when we see something coming out of, um, you know, formal sources like from governments. I mean, we saw this as well with the French health minister, I believe it was, promoting the idea that ibuprofen couldn't be used um, to combat COVID-19. And then WHO stepping in and saying, hey, that's not something that has been um, confirmed. Um, please don't, you know, follow that advice. And thinking about who is really benefiting from, from that kind of either misinformation or disinformation, whether it was intentionally meant to deceive folks or not, to cause harm or not. Um, and that might be a, an interesting point to, to, to just sort of align the definitions of disinformation and misinformation. Yeah. This is, uh, people tend to, I, I think there's some lexicological argument about this, but I, I tend to align with what Samuel Woolley uh, he's got a book out recently called The Reality Game. He studies computational propaganda specifically into great detail at the University of Texas. And he defines it in his work as disinformation uh, is information that is in bad faith uh, propagated from a source when they know it is false. Yeah. They know that it is not true and they say it anyways for whatever motive there might be. Um, and misinformation is when people spread false information unwittingly. They don't necessarily know that yeah. it's not real or that it's not true, but that they amplify it uh, and spread it around. Yeah, that's what I understand too. I've been following lately Dr. Claire Wardle at Harvard who has a similar sort of distinction. And I'm really curious, um, you know, and I think there's a really interesting conversation around technology and ethics here. But when it comes, when, when that either disinformation or misinformation is coming from an official source, who's benefiting, right? Is it 
Is it a particular company that's trying to promote a product that may or may not, um, you know, actually be uh, useful in, in healing from COVID-19? Or is it a mal actor, um, you know, a, a, an internet, you know, a foreign government that is trying to sow discord and panic in our populace? Um, and I think that is something that we, we have to think very carefully about and follow very closely as it regards national security and what's going on in our country today, particularly in an election year. And I'm curious to hear from Igor what your thoughts are um, specifically related to how AI and our uses of emerging technology can help um, prevent the spread of disinformation and misinformation um, to sort of combat this infodemic as WHO is calling it now um, as it relates to COVID-19 and how that relates to the ethical argument. Yeah, so the, the goodness is a really what, a nice way to think of AI is it's just amplifying what humans would normally do anyway. We just don't have enough humans to do the, that work, especially uh, when you think of these uh, moderators. Um, so a dirty secret in, in the tech industry is, in, in a, and it's a little bit disheartening, is we lose up to half of our capacity just fighting these things. And it's, and it's not unexpected, right? If you think of, um, you know, an average, uh, you know, pilot in training, they're spending more time dealing with exceptions than they are, you know, operating the aircraft, landing and, and, and taking off because of all the things uh, that could happen. And so we're losing a lot of our competitive capacity to solving uh, these issues. When you look at the, the um, attacks on elections, you know, when I ask, um, um, you know, friends and colleagues that are working in, in social media, they say, listen, we know that it's, it's a concern for uh, Western democracies. At the same time, there are certain international regions where people are literally getting killed when they're trying to execute their, um, their voting rights. And so we're prioritizing scarce resources towards that problem because while it's a problem in our democracies and we are getting hit by those actors that uh, uh, Josh uh, uh, mentioned at the same time, we have to focus on where uh, it's going to directly um, uh, impact human life. AI, if done right, is a form of uh, objectivity, right? If we get the biases out and, and things of that sort, and it's meant to amplify humans. In the case of, of uh, COVID, what we're seeing is we, can't, uh, we have to get facts out to the caretakers as they're triaging um, uh, their respective communities. Um, we've seen in some cases, where, um, where um, um, private sector entities have dumped um, their uh, documentation into, uh, into various forms of AI, and they found uh, contradictory information that would have prevented, uh, uh, presented a safety risk. And so that hasn't been possible before when you looked at just document comparison or keyword spotting, and so the technologies you know, getting to a point where we, it can start understanding content instead of just blindly comparing uh, content. And so that's an area where, uh, where I think it can help. Yeah, you know, I think that's, that's really helpful to hear from you. And I'm curious to, um, to think about, you know, not just what can be done from a uh, technological perspective, but what can be done from a, an individual perspective, right? And so as we um, you know, dig back into thinking about this from an individual level. You know, you're someone, you're sitting at home now, stuck at home, hopefully, um, <laughs> hopefully taking those precautions, and you're on Twitter, um, you're on your Facebook, there are, you know, there have been a number of maybe slow and incremental changes to, with, uh, to sort of, um, triage against disinformation, right? So if you go to Google or if you go to various platforms, you'll see red alerts now and you'll see um, notifications directing you to official WHO guidance. And there's a lot of coordination happening between WHO and some of these big tech companies right now on COVID-19. Um, but at the end of the day, you're an individual, um, you have your own biases, you know, algorithms underpinning some of these sites are, are probably still, you know, directing you to that kind of 
you know, echo chamber of, of folks who think like you or, or write or type using the same words like you. And so I'm, I'm, what is going on psychologically here and how can individuals who are maybe listening into this conversation, um, what, what is helpful for them to know as they're um, receiving information and filtering through that information? Well, too bad it's not Halloween. Otherwise, I would put on my Captain Obvious suit right now. Um, so listen, we have freedom of speech. We don't have freedom of anonymous speech. So it, it starts with sources and methods. When you follow any one of these uh, rumors, like Clinton is going to be the VP pick for Bloomberg, where did it start, right? So you have to keep peeling that layer until you find where, where these things should actually start. I know there's a difference between different speakers in these press conferences that are relaying information uh, to us. And, and we know that uh, Fauci is giving us a, a warm fuzzy. The head of um, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers is giving us a warm fuzzy. These are folks that are, are respected in their uh, fields. And we know not to take what they say with a grain of salt and, 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 and measure it uh, with, with all of the um, experiences and um, and respect that they entail and they give a lot of you know the comfort that we all need in order to um you know take the right steps in other cases i mean these these people don't have uh you know the credentials and experience to be telling us the things that they that they are telling us so I think it starts with understanding the source and, and credibility of, of that content. And I think what you're starting to see, right, with the Apple App Store blocking certain apps being uploaded that aren't coming from credible organizations, that's starting there when you're starting to see Twitter and other uh, platforms starting to put banners, uh, you know, warning you of, of, um, of the provenance of certain content. It, I think, frankly speaking, there is going to be a moonshot against that idiocracy that's going, going to start rising up because this is an ailment that can only be solved by science. And so all of us are frankly have lost patience with, with the anti-science rhetoric that has been more prevalent over the course of the last decade. And we're gonna come out swinging after this. This thing's not going to be able to take all of us out. And that's too bad for everybody else because we're going to start imposing a, a different worldview that is going to be uh, fact-based. And the machines are going to be supporting of us. And thank goodness we control most of the machines. Thank you for that, Igor. Um, Josh, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I would just say that I'll start off by telling on myself a little bit here. Obviously, the last two weeks have been just an insane acceleration of bad information and real world information about things that are that are really things that are really happening um and i absolutely believed uh that daniel radcliffe had coronavirus like i saw that headline and i looked at it and like i didn't uh i did not like retweet it or anything but i saw that and i was like oh now you know a celebrity has it and i just bought it without uh, engaging in all the same practices that I always talk about. And this, I am just as susceptible even to someone who thinks about this constantly uh, as anyone else is. And that's because our brains are hardwired, especially in times of stress, to take shortcuts and make uh, the cognitive process easier on us so that we can try and make better decisions. A lot of it boils down to a biological need to survive, but sort of the the those 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 higher sort of automatic functions and how we judge risk how we how we understand information as it's presented to us and what we believe and what we don't a lot of that is hardwired into pathways uh that make it super super easy for us to be wrong and to believe stuff that isn't true um so uh, i will align certainly with um what igor said about considering the source when we do a training on how to spot propaganda and disinformation for organizations, uh, we operate from the, the standpoint of uh, truth matters. Ethically, we're making an assumption that the organization we're talking to uh, values truth uh, and is going to operate in good faith. You have, to, you have to outline the reality in which you're going to operate. And then you say, all right, now, as information comes into you, you have to consider the source. Because if you don't read past the headline, um, if you don't check an author, if you don't think about supporting sources, and I'm talking now in like sort of a, both a snap moment in which you see a headline and maybe retweet it without reading the article, which everyone has done before because you agree with it. And you're like, yeah, I'm going to reinforce this idea. Um, 
you know, I am very conscious of not doing that, but it takes a real level of discipline to see a headline, click into it, read it, think about who the author is, consider the source, check the URL. I mean, the reason that computational propaganda and, and disinformation campaigns for an or domestic work so well is because they are geared towards people doing stuff on the internet on autopilot. Yeah. This is also why phishing works so well because people count on you to check your email on autopilot. So then now, especially with so many more people working from home and being much more extremely online than they usually are, um, the risk is much higher for people to get information from health insurance companies or from public health or from county uh, government organizations or from your company or from HR about uh, having anything to do with COVID-19. Uh, sometimes it's going to be spreading bad, bad information and sometimes it's going to be a play to try and compromise your credentials. Um, so it's yeah. to, 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 you ask what individuals could do adopting in a posture of digital risk thinking and digital risk awareness and trying to not multitask and trying to not do anything on autopilot and trying to be, uh, judicious, um, and, and really active and intentional and in considering what it is you're reading and the information that you're consuming is I think the, the single best uh, prophylactic against you accidentally becoming an agent of misinformation um, and spreading around stuff that's not true just because you 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 caught it in a moment where your brain uh, made you assume that it was that it was true yeah you know I think you're absolutely right about that and um, you know when I was in this conversation with my friend Eddie at Storyful about this topic as it relates to COVID-19, he was telling me, you know, we're in, there is a data void when it comes to um, sort of authenticated information out there. And that's, I think, why WHO is doing its best to um, align with some of these big tech platforms to make sure that their resources are the ones that are popping up first. And so adding to that, that we understand that in this sort of infodemic of lots of information coming at us, um, that the void can be filled very easily with some of this misinformation or disinformation, and, and we should be cognizant of that. Well, and I'll say that I think the WHO strategy there, uh, and I'm, I am usually very hard on big tech platforms who usually do a bad job of policing disinformation and having real actual policies about it, um, but the moves that they have made, um, regardless of how effective they have been, I think in the in the grand scheme of things are going to be effective in terms of 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 helping to at least mitigate or combat disinformation about COVID nineteen because um, if someone is ideologically um, aligned uh, ideologically opposite to you and they you view them automatically as a partisan source I'm talking generally out in the populace now and you say this thing that you've heard or this thing that you're saying is a lie and it's not true that doesn't move the needle for a lot of people that are locked into um, a crisis of belief. Yeah. However, if a loved one says, oh, you know, uh, you know, dad or Uncle Billy or whoever it is, like, that's not true. And this is actually came and this came from these real sources. Like, there might be a core of that. Well, I don't trust the World Health Organization, or it's the New World Order, or, you know, whatever sort of thing that gets baked into that. But that, that, means that you are hearing a, a, a countervailing story from a resilient audience that you are inclined to believe, right? That yeah. you're inclined to believe someone that loves you and that you trust so that if they present information. So when, uh, when WHO and, uh, and public health organizations push really hard as broadly as they can to communicate information about um, the coronavirus, it adds to the effect of you're arming people that maybe are not extremely online and engaged in the active spread of disinformation uh, to be able to talk to them in real life, in person, on the phone, in one-on-one -on -one chats, whatever it is. I mean, I watched Westworld last night uh, and it was recorded on my DVR and this was on HBO and leading into Westworld was an ad from the CDC explaining things about coronavirus and telling me where I could go for resources. You know, I think... Um uh, that's actually very much related to work that I do in trust building in, in communities that are technically adverse or tend to be adverse to one another. And it's something that we find in um, this overall uh, sort of healthcare related misinformation campaigns, the people who are being targeted um, and also with political um, campaigns, right? People who are generally being targeted aren't the ones on the extremes. It's the ones in the middle who are sort of hesitating about which direction they want to go. 
And I think with that, it would be a good moment to, to re move towards our discussion of the elections. Um, obviously, the elections um, in 2016 and disinformation has been a topic um, that has been spoken about a lot um, in the last few years. And, um, and because of that, I think there's been increased attention and um, some ownership and action taken by some of these bigger tech organizations. I want to just, you know, Camille, who would have been the one to bring this up, um, would have wanted us to talk about um, specifically how uh, campaigns, disinformation campaigns targeted vulnerable communities. Um, we saw in the 2016 election how campaigns were very um, uh, much by the uh, Russian Internet Research Agency were targeting the African American community. Um, we've seen also a lot of work written by another Truman Fellow, Christopher, um, I think Goldsmith is his last name, on how that dis disinformation campaigns have targeted um, the veteran community. And I'd love to, um, to hear from you guys what you think about um, you know, how we've moved from 2016 to 2020, um, what is still going on that we should be aware of, what has changed, and then um, specifically how we can reach those communities that are t uh, do tend to be targeted um, so that they're not going to be susceptible to that um, this time around. Um, and you know, when I think about this as well, I think about we're in an election year, what are, are the different, um, you know, uh, what are the platforms out there um, with the folks that are in the running? Um, what, are they, what are they saying about this? Um, I, you know, Elizabeth Warren's no longer in the Democratic, um, the, the running for the Democratic candidacy, but she had a plan for it, um, which is, uh, you can find it online, Fighting Digital Disinformation. And a lot of interesting points in her plan related to what big tech companies could do, what governments could do, and how there could be public-private partnerships and open data. So I'm curious to hear from you guys, both of you, um, you know, what you think about how we can, what, what has, if you could share awareness again, right, like share with the, with the community what has changed from 2016 to 2020 or not, and how we can, um, sort of prevent some of those same populations from being targeted in a way um, that was um, unfair to those communities in 2016. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, it, it starts with voter suppression, right? So that's, uh, that's how a lot of these tools were leveraged against uh, those um, uh, populations as well. At least it starts, at least we now are aware that that was happening and we can start figuring out ways to educate folks on on where these things are coming from. I know since since that time, I guess Facebook changed things where um, you do have to be vetted in order to do political ads of, of a certain type right now. That doesn't stop a lot of the trolling uh, that happens through those uh, platforms as well that are specifically uh, uh, targeted. Um, uh, we we we've seen a lot of that um, with Cambridge uh, Analytical style platform that we're trying to dissect all of us and put us into neat um, you know eigen behavioral buckets if you uh, if you will uh, in order to do micro targeting and um, and uh, I don't I don't know that we've seen and uncovered all of the different uh, actors that were. Um, uh, collecting such data uh, hidden inside of games and things of that sort because again with AI you can infer all sorts of interesting things uh, in order to divide and conquer folks. So I think at least there's more awareness of it. Um, you know, so that's that's um, that's at least a good start as, as far as the execution side of it. Again it's, it's as Josh said these platforms have been continually investing in it because I think uh, they don't want to get called in front of the hill uh, any any longer uh, for some of these uh, uh, pitfalls that we experienced. So there's a lot more attention um, uh, paid to these um, uh, facts. But I, I don't I don't know if um, um, you could try to filter and just prohibit all political speech unless um, 
you know, we can claim our real identities on platforms such as Twitter and just try to knock that at the source, uh, similar to, as, uh, as Josh uh, uh, men mentioned previously, that knowing where an idea originates, you know, gives you a lot of power to figure out whether you believe it or not. Well, one thing that is curious to me, and I'd like to hear your perspective, Igor, Igor, from an AI perspective, I hear mixed things about the ability for um, these big tech codes and others to actually fact check at the rate and the speed at which it needs to be done to combat some of this disinformation. Can AI really solve that problem? Uh, no, not not totally in the short term, right? But this is going to be a never-ending project for the rest of of, uh, of our respective lives. So whoever's working these problems is going to have lifetime employment on these uh, on these issues. You know, people in our field, practitioners, we we actually do try to remove all bias and uh, and and have highly objective systems. For instance. Um, even with an AI assistant, such as a Siri or a Google Assistant or uh, an Alexa-style uh, system, we even care about how uh, um, uh, we describe some uh, a politician's biography, because we can subtly change opinion, positively or negative, based on even the words that we select as 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 we uh, display that bio. So there's been research even done on that in terms of how do we present the most objective system that doesn't it isn't biased in one direction or another so that we allow voters to make their own uh, informed uh, decision. Um, that's uh, you know one, one place where uh, we at least remove it because we can control uh, the top, that content that's going out. The content that's being left in the system is, is far more problematic, uh, far more problematic. Now you've seen escape valves, right? So whenever uh, there's a, a mass block on certain types of hate speech, what ends up happening uh, is that you know the, the water finds a way around the rock, right? And it, it, it ends up going onto other platforms uh, like uh, Gab, for instance. You know that became the alternate Twitter um, uh, universe for folks, um, you know that had those uh, those beliefs. I, uh, I I think this is sort of a bad news, bad news thing. Um, the threat has not lessened since 2016. Uh, and in fact, the methods have evolved. And sometimes they evolve in ways which are technological. And sometimes they evolve in ways that are uh, that are more practical. Um, you know, the the big sort of spectacular story about the 2016 election was the IRA had that building in St. Petersburg where everybody worked and they were uh, engaging in, uh, you know, essentially being international meme lords and, and driving narratives about Pizzagate and doing all, doing all kinds of stuff uh, during the 2016 election. Um, our observations uh, in, our, in our work uh, around the 2018 election showed that uh, they had started to outsource that to, I'm fairly certain to what, what tended to amount to contractors across the Eastern Bloc, um, people that um, would you, you'd see them in a group that had 250,000 people in it and it would be, um, a, you know, a, a QAnon group or somebody that's dedicated to the secession of Texas or something. Um, and it's a, it's a Facebook, um, group where you don't have to pay money to, to put content into it. It's not ads. It's not out on the timeline. It's just a, a Facebook group. Um, and somebody would post, you know, 15 QAnon memes in a day and get tons of traffic, uh, and sort of stoke this fire in these communities that had been built uh, relatively organically. And it's just by the, the, the supply of this information can never hope to meet the demand for people that want to have their worldview reified on the internet. Uh, and then that results in uh, coordinated takedown attempts at uh, other Facebook pages or celebrities or people that they don't agree with, um, or bringing in news stories about a certain legislator that uh, wanted to do something uh, fairly benign, uh, but they were an agent of the deep state. So now 10,000 people are going to go try and swarm their Facebook page and uh, do this sort of thing. Uh, now, um, uh, there was great reporting on this about uh, 10 days ago from CNN uh, about the, the Russian intelligence's new operation. Um, and this is specifically targeting uh, African-American voters, Black Lives Matter in the United States. Uh, and it's that they had outsourced it um, to to groups that were uh, media companies, 
uh, digital uh, digital companies that were both participating in this either wittingly or unwittingly uh, in West Africa, uh, particularly in uh, Ghana and, and Nigeria. Um, and this was, uh, I think, Twitter took down uh, a group that they had removed 71 accounts that had 68,000 followers. Um, Facebook went through and found a bunch of groups and said, oh, this is, this is coordinated uh, election interference activity um, where groups from other countries are actively working together to try and stoke uh, racial tension inside of the United States. This is the goal of, of disinformation campaigns. The, the root purpose of it is, um, or I guess really the big idea, the pitch that you would see on the PowerPoint slide is we're going to destabilize Western democracy, right? Um, the, the, the targeted tactical goal is always voter suppression. And that group that you talk about in the middle that could be persuaded one way or the other, people used to think of them as swing voters. Now I think in this age of disinformation where we exist, there are people that are either going to be motivated to go and vote uh, and be reasonable and break across the bell curve like you would imagine, uh, or they're gonna be suppressed and stay home because they enter a state of reality apathy where everything is a lie and everyone is screaming at them and they don't know what to believe, so they tune out. Uh, the swing voter now, the swing is not from one party to another, it's whether or not they'll engage in the process. Um, so these threats uh, evolve quickly. Um, we haven't even gotten to a real era yet where deep fakes are truly weaponized in political campaigns um, to audiences that are inclined to believe um, the, the partisan worst of, what, of whatever and however it is presented to them. Uh, and that's getting cheaper and easier to do. Um, the, what the platforms are doing, I think, uh, it's unfair for me to say that they haven't done anything because clearly they have done some things. Um, they do not want to be in the business of calling balls and strikes, um, which from a bottom line shareholder perspective, I think I understand, but from, uh, platforms that have as many people that are on them, you know, Facebook has 2.7 billion users, something along those lines. Uh, and Twitter is now a conduit for foreign policy uh, and, and domestic policy in the United States. Those two things in and of themselves, I think, not only represent danger, but also um, an incurred responsibility. Mm -hmm. yeah. And some, like something, they are doing some things. Facebook has made it so that you have to identify yourself and claim and verify that you are this before you run a political ad. That in no way stops someone from claiming and disclosing that they are running a political ad and uh, linking a post in that ad that goes to a website that is full of lies and, and, and intent to deceive. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And it, it you know, is directly related to conversations I'm having about like, and you see this, right? Like Mark Zuckerberg is, is writing op-eds and, or his team is, and trying to get out ahead of some of this stuff, but at, maybe to assuage all of our fears, but at what point, is it kind of masking, hey, like that we're, we're paying attention to this small corner, but actually the problem is much bigger. Um, I'd like to, with that, um, bring the discussion towards some of that um, big tech and policy um, connection and, and speak to some of the questions we're getting from the group online. And note to all of you guys and gals that are listening in, um, please do um, give us your questions. I will now focus on um, relaying those questions as best I can to our expert panelists. So related to this discussion, um, we have a question. How do we balance combating disinformation and the skill large tech firms are able to leverage in this effort with anti-competitive concerns around those massive firms. So really, again, getting at that balance of how much is being done, is it enough, um, and, and that balance between um, competitiveness and regulation and what that means for, at this point, global public health when it comes to COVID-19 and obviously national security in our democracies it comes to elections. So no small topic. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I, I want to plan an ideological stake and sort of like open up where our Overton window is on this. And you guys can disagree with me if you want, but I think it ought to be illegal to lie on the internet. That's where I want to start from. Because until uh, the global pandemic happened, um, I viewed this as the, the most critical existential threat other than climate change that I, that I could imagine because it poisons and erodes not just 
elections and not just whether or not a movie is going to get fair reviews. It, it, it gets at the heart of everything because it is at the heart of people's ability to objectively understand reality. And I think until it is framed that way to big tech firms, like there are people who come out and say, well, you know, Facebook should be a public utility or we should break it up or whatever it is. I think that you can't even get to having that conversation until you really examine the responsibility, um, whether they wanted it or not, that a huge platform has when it is so obvious that it can drive huge groups of people to destructive action. Jimmy Carter's hammer, right? Yeah. So t t take a tool like a hammer and put it in Ted Bundy's hand and he's going to cause mayhem, put it in Jimmy Carter's and he'll build you a habitat for humanity. Right. Um, that's uh, that's the constant refrain. And and certainly the uh, big tech is being opportunistic as well, where, hey, because of this scale, we can marshal resources in order to do this um, that would soak any startup. Um, and so that's uh, that's their defense. I mean, I, and I, all that to say, I understand that this is a difficult problem and it involves both hard choices and choices with a huge array of unknowable or unintended consequences. It's very difficult for humans to project themselves into the future uh, as it is. And for big, big tech firms that as platforms represent actual cognitive ecosystems for the human race, in effect, um, none of it is easy, but the piecemeal patchwork stuff uh, that is unevenly applied, um, I understand that there are personnel restrictions. I understand that some of it is just what can we get to uh, and how can we get to it just in terms of what's possible. But I think that the, I think that the philosophical question has to start from we have to think about whether or not humans are going to be able to, to actually objectively understand reality five years from now. Yeah. No, and I think, um, I think you really have, have spoken to the heart of this, right? It's, there's a shift in our culture absolutely happening. And to be honest, um, I think there's going to be a shift in our culture after we get out of this COVID-19 crisis too, in how we relate to one another virtually. Um, and what that means for our day to day, um, both in terms of, of work, but as well how we receive and digest information. Um, you know, there's some comments in our question and answer related to actions um, and um, some actions being taken. Uh, and this is, this is something that actually is in Elizabeth Warren's plan um, to fight digital disinformation as well related to increasing the, the amount that big tech companies um, are flagging state funded or um, state content written uh, t uh, sort of content. Um, but also thinking about media, and this is one of the questions, media and information literacy, um, and what campaigns or um, solutions are being presented either from government or from big tech companies or from others to increase um, education and uh, in educational awareness to the broader public to uh, effectively build our immunity <laughs> to this type of disinformation. So if we can't have a democracy without it, maybe it needs to be part of the high school curriculum. Fact checking. I mean, we have to start at the source, right? So for the next generation, understand where information comes from and it's useful to you whether you go into the sciences or not. It just needs a, to be part of a curriculum. I had a terrific world history teacher named Eddie Sewell when I was in high school. Um, and he did a whole two days, which in a Texas high school, Texas public school, um, is pretty remarkable. He did a whole two days on propaganda and political propaganda and how it was used and who pioneered it and what advancements came from it. Uh, and as a result of that, for the last five years or so, the question that keeps me up at night is what if Stalin had had Twitter? When we think about problems along these lines, when we think about what a big tech company can do, I am all for as much public and civic education as we can get from big platforms. Uh, I would love nothing more than a series of videos where uh, you know, Mark and Jack get together and they talk about how to, how to understand 
whether information is good or bad on your platform and present it in a way that does not whistle past the graveyard of understanding your own biases, but encourages people to investigate their own biases uh, and interrogate how they came to think about something in the way that they do. However, because cognitive bias works the way that it does, there has to be some sort of spectacular event where not because big uh, people with big audiences take advantage of freedom of speech and use it to be destructive, but some somebody takes advantage of their position and their reach and their power um, in a real actual functional way to do that most American of things and speak truth to power. A perfect example of this could be, you know, as someone who has worked in advertising and digital communications for a long time, if I knowingly tell a lie in an ad, I get in trouble for it. I get fined, somebody can sue me, I can go to, like, that's a real thing. You're not supposed to do that. There's laws about it. Yeah, if, in, the private sector, in the private sector, we're not allowed to insider trade either. Right. You know, it's the same thing. So then if I were to go... Uh, Let's say that I put out a publication that said um, you should take chloroquine because it's going to cure coronavirus. And I, and I put that out into the world and did it and did it and did it. And then uh, a couple of people took it and died. I would have a legal liability for that. I so could get in trouble for that. Yeah. So basically advocacy to have some kind of accountability when this either misinformation or even disinformation is coming from public officials um, or there, international organizations that are trusted. Information from, disinformation from official sources uh, is the most dangerous version of this because people are trained to believe the government, right? And like, yes, there are people who are like, I don't believe the government and Obama's invading or whatever, but like, that's the core, that's how what happened yesterday happened. So Twitter, to their credit, came out and said, we are really aggressively going to police disinformation and misinformation about COVID-19. If we see stuff that's intentionally false or people that are putting these narratives out here that's, that's wrong about this disease, we are going to disable those accounts. We're going to remove the content and they're going to get banned. Yeah. By we that own logic, Donald Trump should be banned from Twitter as of today. If you oh, do something I like that, it moves the conversation into... There was, there was a consequence for this direct action which resulted in someone's death, right? Yeah. That's different than any other conversation we've had before about, well, maybe they'll ban things or maybe they'll move in this direction or whatever it is. It is a concrete real world event around which then that conversation crystallizes. Yeah, but they, they have immunity. Um, I'd like to understand why the public sector is immune to malpractice. You know, we do it for, for because of the assumption that they won't lie. <laughs> right. So what really, happens, that's we why. assume they're operating in good faith, which they are not. Well, Related that's to right. this discussion, thinking again about the individuals who are receiving this information, um, we've had a few questions about um, segments of the population that are more or less susceptible to this kind of um, both propaganda, but also like dis or misinformation coming from um, these, you know, trusted public actors. Is there, um, so a couple of questions around this, are, are there generational differences in terms of susceptibility? If you have any thoughts on, on that, as well as what is the best way to reach folks who maybe are that middle of the ground sort of group of people that are perhaps more apathetic to engaging in critical thinking and um, that whole process of understanding, okay, I need to dig into this information before I just repost on my Facebook or something. Well, let me ask you this. Let's, let's anchor that argument, right, that we're going to ha have with, uh, with these people. Will they now believe that this was not a hoax because they will get ill or they're going to lose uh, one of their family members. Start from there for, because maybe they're, they're the types of folks that actually need something tangible before they can weigh uh, um, the outcome and, and, and whether that uh, original information was correct or not. We, we have unfortunately a perfectly designed uh, case study here whether uh, 
you know, whether they should believe this stuff or, or not. And, and you're going to have to use that as an anchor for everything else that you're going to try, uh, you know, telling them is, uh, is fictitious as well. And so we're going to, unfortunately, we have, a, a, you know, something physical, something tangible that you're going to be able to launch um, uh, that education with. And, you know, I, I having, having, I started working in using the internet to talk to people uh, before Google existed. And I, it is my firm belief that in, on the actual grand scheme of things, I don't necessarily think that any one group is necessarily more susceptible to getting taken advantage of with this information or taking advantage of someone's cognitive bias than any other group. I think some groups are more targeted than others and there is a there is a greater supply there is a greater intention to deceive some communities uh some demographics uh which results in you could theoretically say that you know the, this group has this come out and it's more there where it is um you know you look at what's happened with veterans and what's happened with african-american voters you know that is uh, an opportunity by foreign intelligence and then echoed by domestic groups to take advantage of uh, social divides in in our polity, and to try and and, and increase rank or harden behavior, um, in, increase polarization. But if you look at you know the, in 2018, the national campaign strategy from the White House on down for the midterms was we are going to find social issues uh, that represent cracks in our society, and we're going to apply pressure. So. I, I don't necessarily think that, um, and I absolutely could be wrong about this. It's my opinion, and only my opinion, that I don't think any one group is more susceptible to this. I think it's just about who gets targeted uh, and and how intensely people try to take advantage of them. Uh, and by the way, but, yeah, and I, I don't mind other people's opinions, but I want them to be from real people, right? So maybe yeah. there needs to be a feature across social media where we can go into our little profiles or our little settings, click a button and say, Comments from real people only. I don't mind if they contradict uh, my worldview. I don't care if they're debating us. I, I think that's healthy, especially in, in the form of government that, uh, that we have. But at least let it be real folks and figure out a way to, uh, to, to vet them. And maybe that's, you so know, long where we self-select to be verified and then you can select only to get from that pool. That's right. And, and it's not an echo chamber. It's this is a real person with a real opinion that has value and, and we can start from there because we're not, we can't take on a, a, a faceless uh, opponent. Yeah. Um, and I'm looking forward to your and Josh, both of you seeing how the work that you're doing on the front lines of this continues to go out ahead of, of these issues and help us resolve them. I'm mindful of the time. Um, I want to, ask uh, a final question to the panelists um, and also say thank you to all of you who have asked questions. I've done my best to integrate your questions into the discussion, but please do feel free to reach out to us afterwards um, if you have any further questions or you'd like um, to provide more comments, we'd be happy to, to have those. So um, aside from both of your own platforms, um, so Rogue Metrics and Cryon, um, what do both of you recommend as trusted resources on the topic of disinformation and how it relates to our democracy that all of those participating today um, should pay some attention to? Well, si similar to cybersecurity, um, you're going to have to solve this the same way, meaning uh, it, it used to be where you can have a blacklist and you just keep adding things you know, to that, uh, to that pool, but there's just, uh, you know, too much noise now. And so the best practices in cybersecurity are essentially just having a whitelist and focusing on those uh, resources and being very judicious whenever you add something else to the, uh, to the whitelist and, and very prescriptive. So, you know, similar to what I stated before about only, uh, you know, having a discourse with real people, you're all, you're also going to have to do a better job of looking at real sources. Um, that uh, Clinton VP pick for Bloomberg was a perfect example. We all rolled our eyes when we saw it. And then if you kept pulling, um, you know, pulling the thread and, and, and going layer by layer on the onion thing, 
it just got worse and worse and worse and worse with nonsensical uh, uh, sources. I know some of you probably traced it uh, uh, to the actual origin. And yet most people see things close, right? It's, so it's Washington this, examiner maybe, it, you know, it seems close to Washington, but you have all of these things that sound like the things that we remember from our childhood in terms of being um, uh, credible sources. And these things are masquerading as cre credible sources. In fact, they they merge credible data with 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 uh, uh, the nonsense, and so you can't really tell. Um, you know, you yeah. you start weighing putting the same weight. So it they're smart weird. about what they're doing. Well, and to to <laughs> Igor's point, like that's a fairly uh, normal tool in the in the GRU playbook of let's. Uh, let's seed websites as advanced persistent threats, whether it's websites or Twitter accounts that report only on legit, accurate le local news for a year and look just like regular local news websites for small towns and then start slipping disinformation into it. So that's, that's a real thing. I think that understanding the big picture, understanding the risk environment is the best way for someone to make changes in their own life, to engage in a, a proactive, resolute, and engaged standpoint of, of digital risk thinking and digital risk awareness. Um, really the best, and it is a book that I wish I had written, the best consolidation of that, particularly in terms of digital media and computational propaganda that I have read all the way along the way uh, is that book I mentioned earlier um, by Samuel Woolley called The Reality Game. Uh, and if you want a little peek into it, he was on Think with Chris Boyd um, a couple of weeks ago, and that's in a, in a podcast that you can go and look up. But it just breaks down how it all works, gives lots of examples of the different kinds of ways that people weaponize social media and digital information, uh, in, and not in necessarily a uh, political way and not centered on just one case. It really is about here is the world we live in now and and here is here is what you need to know about it in order to have a better understanding of 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 how reality is presented to you even uh the educated cool consumer who is very extremely online um it there were things in there that i didn't know um and i think it would be a great baseline educational resource for everyone to read so you could get a proper understanding of where the risk environment was as of about 90 days ago Awesome. And again, for the folks listening, uh, that is Samuel Woolley's book, The Reality Game, correct? Yes. Igor, any um, recommendations on your end? I have a couple I'll give at the end. Yeah, I mean, maybe f to ascertain what's a trusted uh, resource, I think it would be good for them to start documenting their practices in terms of how they fact check so that when you go to any website, you have a specific section that shows what the process is for sources and methods for how they create their content. And just demand that uh, of all of these, um, uh, uh, of all of these retailers of thought, if you will. Um, yeah. I think they're just gonna have to do a job to, sh to show. And that way, when you, when you are trained as, as an individual consumer of this intelligence, you can say, okay, you know, I'm just going to focus on the, on the places where at least there's transparency, like looking at the back of a watch to see how it tells time, and you can trust that resource um, uh, better. So I think uh, they, they can start doing that. Thank you. Um, I would add to, to those resources, um, you know, I think, you know, Josh, earlier in the conversation, you said, hey, I'm, I'm also someone who has made, you know, mistakes in this, in this effort. Um, and this is my day job, right? And I mean, I'm definitely right there with you. Um, one thing that I think is really important is to think about that middle of the road group of people, the vaccine hesitancy folks, and have thoughtful and honest conversations with them, with your friends and family, with yourself, and be open to being wrong. Um, I've definitely had some really great conversations with trusted friends who've called me out when I have, you know, sort of propagated an idea that was just being shared all over Facebook and said, no, no, go, go watch the full video of that, right? And so I think if we all just take a moment to um, 
just be okay with the fact that none of us are perfect and we've probably all done this once or twice, start there and then and engage in critical thinking and honest conversations. Some resources that I found really helpful, um, I'm a big fan of, of anything to do with the technology and mindfulness or technology and ethics conversation. Um, I'm a every other year or so attender, uh, attender of the Wisdom 2.0 conference, um, which is all about technology and mindfulness. There's some interesting work out there by Tristan Harris and the Center for Humane Technology. Um, I'm a virtual fan of Yael uh, Eisenstadt, who's currently with Cornell's Digital Life Initiative, and she has a really great podcast out there um, interviewed by the Center for Humane Technology about her work um, at the CIA and at Facebook and what she's doing now um, in that intersection between policy and big tech and action. And then on a related theme, I'm just gonna put this out there because I've found this to be a really fascinating resource. Um, recently on Hidden Brain podcast, um, Professor Aton Hirsch was interviewed about his book, um, Politics is for Power, um, which talks about political hobbyism versus action. And I think that's a great, I've actually now got his book before Amazon was, was flooded. This was before this crisis hit. <laughs> um, and I've been reading it and it's a really great sort of honest narrative and, and researched and thoughtful narrative about um, how we engage in hobbyism and politics has become like sports watching. And a lot of that has to do with how we engage with social media versus are we actually taking actions to go have those conversations with folks um, in the political arena to, to go knock on doors and speak with people outside of our sort of echo chamber? Obviously right now, given the current um, sort of global status of, of the pandemic. We can't go knock on people's doors, but hopefully when this is all over, um, you know, we can engage beyond the virtual. Um, with that, I would like to thank um, both of you, Josh and Igor, for making yourselves available um, for the great work that you're both doing in this space. Um, I'm really honored to work, to be here alongside both of you, truly, um, and to be a part of this wonderful um, Truman community. Uh, thank you to Jenna ben Yehuda, the president and CEO of Truman National Security Project, and the entire team over there um, self-quarantining during this pandemic. Um, and of course, to our funders um, for allowing this to, to happen. Um, we really do look forward to um, engaging with folks who've been on this call, so um, please do reach out to us. And... Um, Oh, sorry, I just got a question. What was the book? So the book is by Aton Hirsch, um, Politics is for Power. Um, but check out the Hidden Brain podcast in general. I think it's a pretty brilliant one. Um, but yeah, I'm also, uh, as someone who's recently moved to North Carolina, I'm excited that two of the three of us are based here in North Carolina. So that's exciting. Uh, <laughs> go North Carolina. Um, but anyway, stay safe, everyone. Stay home as much as you can. Um, and, you know, our thoughts um, are, are there with you as we sort of collectively seek to, um, to address uh, this global issue. And, um, yeah, please do stay in touch. And with that, I'll say goodbye. Thank you all so much. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Bye. -bye.